came to the topic of environmental racism with a lot of fear, something that a lot of people didn't know. When I was asked in 2012 to take on this project, I had a sociology degree, but I didn't have an environmental science degree. And I was terrified that I would trip up, that I wouldn't know enough. In addition, I had never conducted community-based research before. I think it's often taken for granted that people of color just have an understanding of this type of research, but I didn't. And as a newcomer, relative newcomer to Halifax, I hadn't forged those relationships with affected communities, with African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq communities. So I didn't feel I had the right stuff uh, to do this work when I was approached. But before I begin, I think it's important to define environmental racism. I got asked that question all the time when I started this project. What is environmental racism? How could the environment be racist? Well, environmental racism can be defined as the disproportionate location or siting of polluting industries in communities of color, indigenous communities, black communities, and the working poor. And these are typically those communities that lack a base, an economic base, and a political base to fight back. With much hesitance, I eventually decided to take on this project for several reasons. I was thirsty for a new challenge. I had been conducting research on health, uh, black women's health, black women's mental health, and health in indigenous and black communities for some time. But this offered another type of challenge. Um, and I was thirsty for a challenge at that point. So the focus on the health effects of environmental racism in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities was, of course, interesting because I was a health researcher. But the opportunity to tie the environment with health was a new challenge. And once again, an issue that was relatively outside the box for me. So it was the opportunity to do something new, uh, something that was outside my comfort zone that both scared me, but also intrigued me. So when I met with the environmental uh, activist a few weeks later, I agreed very hesitantly, hesitantly to take on this project. That project was eventually titled The Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities, and Community Health Project, the acronym is the Enri Enrich Project. And I started this project in the spring of 2012. This project looks specifically at the social, the economic, the political, and the health effects of environmental racism in Nova Scotia, specifically in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities across the province. I use an intersectional analysis to look at these issues, to look at health, and to look at uh, the placement of industries in these communities, specifically looking at how race and culture and gender and disability, income and class and rurality converge in shaping health outcomes and the health effects of environmental racism. What's most interesting for me about this project is that it's interdisciplinary and multisectoral. In terms of interdisciplinary, I've had an opportunity, which has always been exciting for me, to work with professors and students in diverse disciplines. Everyone has a place in this project. I work with students and professors in health, in medicine, in planning, in engineering, in environmental science, and in law, and in international development studies. It's been interesting for me because I'm learning from students, I'm learning from professors. Once again, I'm outside of my comfort zone. It's also very much multi-sectoral. In addition to working with students and professors in diverse departments, I get to work with individuals in diverse sectors, uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority and health organizations, government, Nova Scotia organizations that focus on environmental issues. It's been exciting to be able to learn from these diverse organizations and develop new skills and insights. What has also been thrilling for me is the opportunity to be creative 
with this project and innovative. I use multimedia to get my message across and to engage people in different ways and incite people to action. And that has been one of the most interesting things for me to develop, create, and use diverse media, uh, film, uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, traditional media, uh, interviews on television and radio and podcasts, art and music, spoken word, poetry. These have all found a place in this project. So engaging with diverse and creative methods, uh, diverse approaches, uh, working with diverse peoples is central to the Enrich Project. What's most important, however, in doing this work is the opportunity to highlight the agency and leadership of communities that have been on the front lines of environmental struggles over the last several decades, particularly black women and indigenous women. They kind of bear the brunt of much of the struggle and helping uh, to amplify their voices through this project has been key. Because in general, black women, indigenous women, women of color are often silenced. They don't get the same opportunities to be heard. So I make sure within this project that amplifying their voices and their knowledge takes up a central space in the Enrich Project. I also want to illuminate their legacies of solidarity building, organizing, mobilizing, and activism. I come to this project, or I came to this project in 2012, but these women have been doing this work for decades. So the last thing I'm going to do is come in there and assume that I'm doing something new, for example. I want to build on the work that they've been doing for the past decades. It's given me an opportunity to work with women in communities that I never thought I would have worked with. And I continue to be strengthened by their strength um, and their resilience on this issue. They never seem to give up. Then how can I? So the project keeps going. And it keeps going because I keep meeting new people and they take me down a different path. And it re-energizes me and it re-energizes the project. Over the past seven years, I've engaged in diverse activities and initiatives to get the point across, to create awareness about environmental racism in Nova Scotia and across Canada, and to amplify the voices of these communities. And they have taken many forms. Community workshops in the communities have allowed me to get to know the communities, to get a sense of their concerns and their priorities, um, and to get a sense of how they would like me to conduct the project asking them what they think my research objectives should be, what my research questions should be. It's a different way of doing research than the traditional research where I would go in and I would decide uh, what the objectives and research questions would be. I'm asking them instead what they want me to do and how I could be of service. It's also involved student training. Students often come for different reasons. They want to learn more about research, community-based research. They want to engage in civil disobedience with communities and my project offers them uh, those opportunities because I have finally forged some of those meaningful relationships that I wanted to form in the beginning of this project. Publications is also key. Uh, it's important to have evidence. And I was certainly told that when I started the project, where's your evidence, I was told when I began the project. So publishing in journals and writing books on the issue has been central, uh, including a book that uh, was released last year that I wrote called There's Something in the Water environmental racism in indigenous and black communities. Policy and environmental bills are, uh, is really an important issue. I think uh, we can address this issue in many ways, but I think until we have a bill, an environmental bill that centers the experiences of Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities, this is an issue that will be very difficult to address. So working with Lenore Zan, a politician, on the first environmental racism bill in 2015 uh, was really important to me. That bill has since uh, been named Bill 31, an act to redress environmental racism. In 2017, I worked with environmental scientists and community members to co-found Rural Water Watch, which is an NGO 
that is testing water in rural communities and in particular marginalized communities. Uh, so we go into communities that have asked us to go into their communities and we test water, we do workshops, we discuss the link between contaminants and illness, and we also talk to them about their wells and how to keep your wells healthy. Um, it's a small uh, NGO, but we are committed to making sure that it's community-based and that we involve community members and they're leading some of the projects that we're engaged in. Ecojustice is a law charity in Canada, and I've been fortunate enough to forge a relationship with Ecojustice uh, in 2018 when they opened up an office in Halifax. Uh, so it's, it's basically introducing them to some of the communities that I had been working with, uh, but also providing them with results of water testing so they can do what they need to do in order to make a case uh, for some of the communities that have concerns about contaminated water. I have a new partnership that's exciting to me because I am a health researcher uh, with Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, the Health Promotion Division. We're going to start looking at the connections between the social determinants of health and climate change. Uh, so looking at uh, the health effects specifically of climate change in indigenous and black communities. That's a very new project and we're going to be looking at some of the African Nova Scotian communities that have concerns about contamination and uh, high rates of cancer in those communities. I'm also very excited about working with Let's Sprout. Let's Sprout is an organization that was co-founded by two young women, uh, former Dalhousie uh, students, who uh, developed this project uh, in order to develop leadership skills in young women. And we are looking to change the way in which the education system educates young people about environmental justice issues, uh, indigenous and black histories, uh, as well as other social justice issues. So what we're doing right now is looking at how we can develop creative resources and tools for high school and middle school teachers to teach environmental justice issues and environmental racism and Mi'kmaq histories and African Nova Scotian histories in the classroom. And also getting teachers a little bit more comfortable about talking about the hard stuff, about talking about racism and all the, the, the topics that make them extremely uncomfortable. And social media continues to be key, getting the word out there, creating awareness. I have to say that I no longer get that question. Uh, that's not to say that everybody understands what environmental racism is, but I no longer get the question, what's environmental racism? And that's because I've tried to do a lot of work uh, through social media and through public engagement events uh, to raise awareness about the issue over the past seven years. Traditional media, I've done a lot of that as well, but I forged into a kind of new area in terms of documentary film. Uh, when I was approached last year uh, by Nova Scotia-born actress Ellen Page to film a documentary based on my book, uh, and that documentary is called There's Something in the Water. Um, we have been at film festivals and we are doing screenings in community, but we're set for a global release uh, soon next year. And that was co-produced by myself, Ian Daniel, and Julia Sanderson. I talked earlier about my fears, the feeling that I didn't have the knowledge, the right degree. What the Enrich Project has done for me personally over the past few years is it has enabled me to become much more fearless. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I, you know, I, I do community workshops, I, I, I organize public engagement events, I'm speaking to large crowds, I'm speaking to crowds with people with different expertise. I've gotten much more comfortable uh, with what I don't know, but also with what I know. Uh, so I've become much more fearless and it's allowed me to kind of engage in other projects that had scared me. The partnerships that I forged through Rural Water Watch, through Ecojustice, through the Nova Scotia Health Authority, professionals in diverse fields have also curbed my anxieties about the feeling that I have to be an expert in all things. This feeling that you've got to know everything and if you don't know everything, there's no point starting. Now I know that it's okay to not know everything. It's okay not to have the right degree. Or perhaps is there a right degree? Maybe not. The partnerships through those organizations have allowed me to be much more fearless about moving into new territory. And it allowed me to gain insights that are new, um, to gain new skills and understandings and skills in fields that are not my own. 
The Enrich project has also allowed me to be much more forward-thinking, innovative, and creative, because as I said, I'm using all these diverse tools, and that has happened organically. It wasn't something that uh, I really thought about in the beginning, but I think it's important to make use of all platforms and approaches and tools available to you in this day and age. Um, so engagement with social media and traditional media, uh, engagement with art and music, um, and with documentary film, allows one to become much more innovative and creative in terms of how you reach diverse audiences, uh, how you engage people in different ways, and how you incite people to action in different ways, and people respond in different ways. So you always have to be cognizant of the fact that you need to target people with creative approaches. The partnership with Let's Sprout in particular, where we are trying to change the curriculum uh, in high schools and middle schools, have also allowed me to be forward thinking um, in terms of being progressive in terms of some of the institutional barriers um, around environmental justice issues in this province, particularly within the educational system. The root of the problem in terms of addressing environmental racism is the fact that there's a lack of knowledge about the issue. And if we can get to the young people first, uh, who are our future leaders, um, then I think that's really key. Uh, so, working with the Department of Education has allowed me to think more progressively and forward-thinking about how I can address the issue in one particular way. Of course, the, as well, the partnerships with government have been key. I certainly never thought I would be part of an environmental bill. Wasn't looking for that as well. It was just brought up to me. Uh, much of the work that I do through the Enrich Project hasn't really been... Uh, a lot of the things that I've done hasn't been considered really, it's happened organically. I've just been open. That's really important. Open to meeting new people. Saying yes when people say to me, can I meet with you in your office? This is kind of a running joke that I tell people. When people say to me, can I meet with you in your office? I always say yes. I never say no. I'm happy that I have said yes because that's taken me down a different path. I now have rural water watch because when the geologist came and sat in my office and said, I think you need to do a little bit more. I think you need a win. I said, okay, yes, and now we have Rural Water Watch. So what are the takeaways then for women who desire to be more fearless and forward-thinking? Well, move beyond your comfort zone, I certainly did, and your self-doubts and insecurities to engage with new ideas and new approaches. Don't let fear of not knowing stop you in your tracks. In other words, don't wait until you know everything or you think you know everything, to get involved. Get involved, the knowing will happen later. It'll catch up. Be open to using creative or developing creative and innovative approaches, tools, and resources, social media, multimedia platforms, uh, to create awareness, to get your message out, uh, to get people to act in various ways. And most importantly, put a premium on developing partnerships with people in diverse sectors, in di diverse disciplines. They can fill the gaps in your expertise and skill base. And through that, you develop meaningful relationships and interesting projects because of those partnerships. So I'd like to leave you with an African proverb, which I think is a bit of the theme that I'm trying to get across to you today. If you want to walk fast, Walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk together. Thank you.